I know you've got an ear out for the start of the podcast, but before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to remind you to keep an eye out for Daryl Lee's limited edition Christmas treats, because they're in stores now. Like the iconic Christmas nougat pudding, so yummy and a a gorgeous little gift. And some delicious Chrissy-themed twists on your favourite treats, like the Daryl Lee Rockley Road with chewy red and green jelly pieces, green and red crunchy milk chocolate balls, my favourites, and green apple and strawberry flavoured licorice. Watch them disappear. Your Christmas treats table will pop with colour and scrumptiousness. Spread some joy, bring the fun, and enjoy the Christmas tradition that is Daryl Lee. Hurry before they sell out. Daryl Lee makes Christmas better. This is The Five of My Life with me, Nigel Marsh. The series where I talk to notable people about five of their defining things. The way it works is my guests always choose a favourite film, book, song, place and possession. They tell me their choices in advance so I can research them, but they don't tell me why they've chosen them. That's the subject of our conversation. The reason I devised this series is I wanted to create a slightly different way to gain an insight into the real lives and thoughts of prominent people. Tanya Joan Plebisek served as a cabinet minister in both the Rudd and Gillard governments, also as deputy leader of the Labour Party and deputy leader of the opposition from 2013 to 2019. She's been a member of Parliament for Sydney since 1998. So, Tanya, uh, how did you find the process of choosing your five? Was that was that a bit sort of confronting or was it easy or...? Uh, it, it was it was a mixture. I mean, there are some really obvious things. I've always had a favourite song. I've always had a favourite author. But trying to um, have a sort of cross section that gives you uh, a bit of an insight into who I am more broadly, I think that was that was the hard thing. I could have just said Jane Austen, Jane Austen, Jane Austen, Jane Austen, but I wouldn't tell you very much. <laughs> it's favourite not the book, five books film. of my life, yeah. Tanya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, listen, well, thank you for taking it seriously. I, I, I really appreciate um, you you buying into the spirit of it. Now, your film we're going to start with, you have chosen a film from my one of my all-time favourite directors. He directed Brokeback Mountain, The Ice Storm, which is a just the, one of the best films ever made, uh, Life of Pi. I mean, this bloke is, is rocking it. Uh, and you've chosen the 1995 uh, Jane Austen adaptation, Sense and Sensibility. Tell me about that. Well, I, I love Jane Austen. She is my favourite author. And I think this is really the only screen adaptation that truly does her novels justice. Uh, I think Ang Lee has the sort of sensitivity, um, the the light touch that you need with Jane Austen because she's, she's very funny. The way she writes is very funny, um, but she does... She does give you a, a sense of the whole of a person, so their strengths, their weaknesses, their foibles, but she does it in a way that's very affectionate. And I think this film does that. Like, I'm not a Jane Austen snob. I, I watch every screen adaptation. I've even seen the film of Emma, uh, um, which Gwyneth Paltrow plays in, and I, 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 I think that's an abomination to have someone like Gwyneth Paltrow <laughs> playing a Jane Austen character, but nevertheless, I enjoyed it. But Ang Lee has just the the beautiful mix of humour and sensitivity that you need to do justice to these really amazing novels. And, of course, Eleanor is my favourite Jane Austen character. Eleanor's the older sister um, of the three Dashwood sisters. And uh, Why is she your favourite? She's my favourite because she's... She's sensible, she's intelligent, she's responsible, and she feels deeply and strongly, but she doesn't have to display that all the time. Marianne, the the middle sister, um, who is the sensibility in the title, so uh, Eleanor's the sense and Marianne is the sensibility. Um, Marianne feels very deeply, but it's always on display. She's very melodramatic. She's passionate. The, what she reads, the way she reads it, the way she plays the piano. And poor Eleanor's left to deal with the the um, fallout of their father's death and finding a new home and managing the family finances and caring for everyone around her. But she falls deeply in love. And 
she feels that she needs to keep that to herself. And I, I suppose what I like about Eleanor is that she feels deeply, but she doesn't feel the need to display that all the time. So you speak uh, wonderfully movingly about Jane Austen in that film, but but, but what's it, does she mean to you? I actually um, did a speech for the Jane Austen Society of Australia. Uh, they have a big lunch every year f- um, for Jane Austen's birthday and they invited me one year to, to speak to them and I, I wrote... Um, uh, lessons, Jane Austen lessons for a young lady legislator. Oh, fantastic. And I talked, <laughs> right, tell me. I talked about, well, I reread all of the novels. I do that again and again. I, I don't know how many times I've read. Probably uh, my favourite Sense and Sensibility, I would have reread, I don't know, maybe 20 times. Wow. But uh, I reread them all in a row and I thought about the life lessons and the, the lessons for work that I've got from Jane Austen. And there, there's really quite a few of them, including, um, you know, the lessons about kindness and about uh, making sure. I mean, in in my job, you can you can think about how you um, suck up to people who are powerful, or you can think about how you help the people with least power. And I think, uh, for example, in Emma, she has the um, obligation to be kindest to the people uh, who need her help most. Uh, There's so many lessons for life in Jane Austen. What I really like about her writing is the way that your relationship with the characters changes as you yourself learn more about the world. So in Pride and Prejudice, you think, oh, what a silly woman Uh, what a silly woman the mother is until you work out, hang on a minute, she's got five daughters that are going out into the world with nothing because the parents have basically spent their income uh, as they've received it. You would be worried. You would be thinking about how they were going to marry and who they were going to marry and would they marry well. She's a beautiful, subtle, funny, witty, intelligent writer and um, there's Plenty of life lessons to be And to have an enduring appeal, uh, especially around gender roles, and to be from such a different society and era, I think, I mean, what what a a genuine talent and gift that she had. The fact that you can be enjoying it and getting things out of it in 2019, given when she wrote it, is amazing. It's just fabulous. And Pride and Prejudice, uh, I think, in many ways, is a feminist novel. Um, You know, Elizabeth is saying... Uh, I don't, you know, I don't want to marry unless it's for love. Um, and, you know, she's quite explicit about how unfair it is that uh, women don't get to choose. That, you know, they end up uh, either married to someone for fin- reasons of financial security uh, or they end up portionless and penniless. Um, she says how unfair it is that they can't just you know, ride off and make their fortune as young men can. And I don't, I mean, I, I don't know whether Jane Austen thought of herself as uh, making a statement about women's rights, but it, it certainly comes through in the novels. Absolutely. Well, we're going to go back in time for your second choice. We're going to go back before the First World War to 1911. Uh, your book, you've chosen a Francis Hodgson Burnett book, not Little Lord Fontenroy, uh, but The Secret Garden. Tell me about that. Well, I've in fact, I've brought it oh, with pass me. Oh, pass it over. It's <laughs> wonderful. Uh, it's, I, I love this book because it's about a, a very odd and awkward child and that very odd and awkward little girl finds a place for herself and finds some friends. And I think, uh, I mean, I, I, when I was young, I was a, quite... <laughs> odd and awkward child myself. I liked, I was very into reading and my favourite thing in the world was um, climbing a tree, sitting on a branch and reading a book for a few hours until the bark kind of, you know, got too (laughs) uncomfortable to sit on. Uh, I had two brothers who were a lot older than me. So I I did feel like an only child uh, sometimes. And, And this little girl... Mary, she gets she gets teased. She gets called Mary, Mary, quite contrary by the other children, and she and she is um, an awkward and difficult child. But she finds this secret place where 
this secret, secret walled garden. And the mystery of it, I think, the first time I read this, I, I, I found the mystery of it really compelling. But I also think that every child likes the idea of having a place that they have command of, you know, their own garden, their, their own bedroom, uh, a, you know, a little cubby house somewhere. And just as Mary sort of blossoms in life and begins to make friends and become less difficult, the, the garden blossoms and new life comes to it. So I loved, I loved the mental picture I had of this walled garden that was only her own. I loved the, um, the, the other characters in it. So Mary is very difficult, uh, but she, you know, she thinks everybody around her is very difficult. She's always looking for someone to blame. And then as she grows up, uh, or in this novel, she, um, she becomes easier to get along with, more pleasant, and uh, and the garden, you know, blossoms in that time. And I, I read and reread this book as well because I loved the mystery of it and the resolution of it. The, the, uh, you know, love a happy ending. The resolution of it, where these lonely children find someone to love and a and a place that is their own. It's a, it's a charming, inspirational. Uh, but but it's also I think surprisingly thoughtful. There, there's a line in it which I, I just think is wonderful: "Is where you tend a rose, a thistle cannot grow." And and that I mean obviously that might be true in a gardening sense. But it's like if you have a smile on your face, you can't have a frown. If you have a positive thought, you can't have a negative thought. It's it's the book is it's like not a children's book. I mean I know it is, but it's it's rewarding on every on every level. I, I reread it if, again a few years ago, and I enjoyed it as much as as an adult as I did as a child but I've I've thought of it quite differently so I thought of um, the father uh, in the book Colin's father who is so grief stricken that he's unable to care for his son uh, and is is running from that grief all the time and how he finally comes home and is able to um, reconcile his grief and think about the love that he has for his son as an adult, I was much more focused on that and the the I suppose the healing power that the garden and mm. uh, has for him. So tell me about talking about your um, about the, the dad in the book. Tell me about more about your your childhood and and Joseph and Rose and and when you were growing up. Did, did you speak Slovenian? Is that right in in your fat around the kitchen table? Uh, well, yes and no. I mean, I was born in Australia, so. Um, I, I can speak Slovenian. We spoke Slovenian when I was very little, so it was my first language, I guess. My, was, my mum was home looking after us. We spoke Slovenian. Then when I started school, I pretty quickly switched to English. My oldest brother was born in Australia. We were all born in Australia, but my oldest brother started school not speaking English because he was home with mum and she was speaking Slovenian to him. He, her English wasn't that great. Uh so I was lucky I had older brothers and by that time TV. So I think I probably learnt TV, uh, TV English from Humphrey B. Bear and Miss Pamela. Um, I, I, I love having a second language. It's actually beautiful to have two cultures to draw on. Uh, but my Slovenian now is a bit, bit rusty, I'd have to say. It, it, it's better when I'm there for a few days or a few weeks, um, but I don't get much chance to visit Slovenia these days. Uh, I remember when I was a child, we'd go there and I'd, I knew I'd sort of settled in after about the second week, I'd start dreaming in Slovenian and I'd think, yeah, okay, my language is okay now, I'm, I'm dreaming in Slovenian. Um, my parents were, well, my, my I've still got my mum, my dad died a few years ago, but they're just beautiful people. They're lovely, kind-hearted, hard-working uh, you know, decent people who always looked after us beautifully, looked after their neighbours and their community. Um, one of my favourite sort of illustrations of my father, uh, the sort of person he was, we had a an empty sort of patch of land across the road from us where the council built a car park and they put in these little saplings around the car park. And in summer, 
there was no tap or hose down there. My father used to fill up these huge buckets um, from our place and carry them across the road and water the trees every weekend to make sure that they survived. And he, I mean, I think the thing about that was he he never wanted any acknowledgement or praise for doing that. It was just the right thing to do. And that's the their whole lives. They were people who just wanted to do the right thing. They didn't need anyone to notice it. They didn't need any congratulations or applause for that. They just wanted to live their life in a way that uh, looked after and supported other people and made the world a better place. And I, I think there's a lot of quiet, good people like that around, but I was lucky to be raised by two of them. Well, it's wonderful uh, listening to you. It's a, quite a nice link to your third choice uh, because the title, Wide Open Road, you know, suggests the, the journey. And I, I am incredibly grateful to you because as an immigrant myself, a POM, I had never heard, to my shame, that song. Oh, it's so such now, a great song, isn't it? it? You know, a hundred times. I've been you know, humming yeah. it for the last three weeks. Um, but there was an amazing review of the video, the official video of it, which I just thought, uh, one of the best things I've read, which was, this video is basically an entire Tim Winton novel in four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so tell me about the 1986 Triffid's song, Wide Open Road, and why you chose it and the story behind it. Well, it's just a great song. You know, if it had no story behind it and no no personal um, connection, it would just be, a, you know, standalone as a great song. But uh, I love the Triffids more generally. And once again, I have brought a prop, which, oh, this is, is, fantastic. which is always <laughs> wonderful when you're listening to the wireless, isn't it, to have props in the studio. <laughs> That's so thoughtful of you. We're, we're going to post a picture of you with your five items. But this is a framed set list from the Triffids uh, from the 1984 tour, Melbourne tour. So you are a rolled gold fangirl. This is very impressive. It's a fantastic song because I think it really, that um, comparison with Tim Winton is a really terrific comparison. It gives you the sense of that, well, the wide open spaces of Australia. So it is, I think... uh, a, a very Australian song. I don't think you could write that song about anywhere else. So I love that about that period in the 80s when we had bands like the Triffids, the go the Lighthouse Keepers. I think they are all really uniquely Australian bands and they were singing our culture and singing our landscape. So I love that. But the Triffids, I think, um, in particular, have a wistfulness about their music that reminds me of being a teenager. I, that, you know, every party you go to, you think, am I going to find true love at this party? I, I'm so glad you said that because there's a line. I mean, I've been researching the song and listening to it. There's a line in it, the chorus indeed, which is, so how do you think it feels sleeping by yourself when the one you love is with someone else? And I wondered, is, is, did you choose this because it's some tortured early love affair that, of, of some bloke who got away or whatever? Or... No, it, it, actually not at all. Um, I, I mean, obviously I, I had my fair share of tortured teenage romances, <laughs> but uh, the, the reason I like this song in particular is because of that um, sense it gives you of, of the landscape. But also this period of music... Uh, when I was a kid, I was in primary school when my brother first, my middle brother, who was 10 years older, first started taking me to record stores with him. So we used to um, catch the bus to Denali Station, catch the train into town, uh, walk to Red Eye Records or one of the other record stores and spend hours just with the headphones on, yes, listening to yes. songs. Just... Do, they, do they have booths in Australia? I, I actually get to stores in England where you stand in a booth and listen. It, it was more a, a series of turntables with headphones attached <laughs> and uh, he and I would be standing next to each other and he'd be saying, oh, listen to this one, listen to this one. So it was the time when I really felt closest to my brother and... This song, um, because it's about love and loss, reminds me of him. He died about 20 years ago. And 
I've always loved this song, but um, we played it at his funeral. Right. And the reason we played it at his funeral is because it's about missing someone and we, you know, we still miss him. So whenever I hear this song, it reminds me of him. Fourth choice, you have chosen the Royal National Park. Now, I think we, we might have something in... Speaking of tortured teenage love affairs, uh, oh. many of them started. <laughs> what, you, you, you... Not many. I mean, I know, that sounds terrible. <laughs> One or two of them may have had a backdrop of beaches in the Royal National Park. So, so, so your go-to date was let's go for a walk? Or was, or... Sometimes, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I really like the Royal National Park from a very early age uh, because just like the, that, you know, those Australian bands that I was talking about earlier give you that sense of freedom, going to the, the, into the bush um, gave me that sense of freedom. And we used to go, you know, almost every weekend, I guess, when I was a kid, we have a picnic at Audley Weir or go bushwalking or go um, kayaking in Bundina, kayaking around Port Hacking. And I loved the sense of um, physical strength and confidence you could get, you know, climbing over rocks and jumping off cliffs into the water. And have you done the Watermala cliff jump? No, because that's uh, idiocy and people keep breaking <laughs> their backs <laughs> doing that. <laughs> I'll tell my two twin daughters who've yes, done it. <laughs> one, one of the stupidest things I have ever seen is a father holding on to a two or three year old <sighs> child doing the Watermala cliff jump. What, with the child? With the child. And of course, the heavier you are, kind of the deeper you go and the longer it takes you to come up. This idiot man had this child underwater for God knows how long before they came up spluttering and the child screaming. That's Um, horrible. Sorry to sound judgmental, (laughs) but I am all for physical risk. (laughs) That is idiocy. Um, But there are other safer places. places where you can dive into the water and uh, and really enjoy it. And I love Watermulla. It's beautiful. Uh, if you can manage to go down midweek. Th- these days the Royal National Park is actually very, very crowded. I, I went down to Burning Palms recently, uh, which is somewhere that I used to spend, um, a, friend of, uh, a friend of ours had a shack down there and we used to spend weekends down there and sometimes two or three weeks during the school holidays. And it was great, you know, kerosene lamps, kerosene fridges, uh, old Argus stoves, just um, shacks built during the Depression made out of offcuts. And people lived there during the Depression. It, 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 it's a unique uh, part of Australian or Sydney history, actually. Um, but we it's kind of pretty close to camping, really. Uh, and um, we'd spend weeks down there and you'd hardly see another soul. And I was down there recently and there was a a parade of people walking down to the figure eight pool, which is uh, just around the bottom of the cliff from Burning Palms. What I loved about it uh, as a kid and as a teenager was that incredible sense of freedom you get from being in the Australian bush and the sense of physical confidence you get and competence uh, when you're climbing around up and down cliffs and swimming and, you know, uh, (laughs) just washing in the creek, no showers I, I, or anything I like that. It's great. I completely concur. I mean, I, I adore the Royal National Park. And it's Marley Beach. I remember standing on there laughing my head off just out of out of joy. You go, I can't believe, I mean, it only took me an hour to get here and I'm. it's like I'm in the middle of the wilderness. It's beautiful. And then I spied some litter. Oh, and, and, uh, you, you know, my, it's my, maddening, my, isn't it? Yeah, my, my, What's my, wrong my, with people? My shoulders actually physically dropped yeah. and I sort of had a, oh, I can't. Talk to me a little bit about um, your view of <laughs> where we're headed. Apart don't from don't ask me about litter. I, I'm, no, no, not, I'm not litter, but opposed. <laughs> I am firmly opposed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I could talk to you about that for the environment for ages, but I'm going to move you on to your fifth and final choice, which is usually my favourite because people get very personal uh, on this choice. And you've chosen from as your possession a wooden goanna carving from the Purple House in Alice Springs. Tell me about that. And tell me you've brought it in, like the. <laughs> I, I actually have got a photo if you, if you want to see it. <laughs> Good on you. On my phone. Um, 
Well, I love I love this uh, go out and carving because it's a beautiful piece of art. But I bought it um, not just because it's a beautiful piece of art, but because the um, sculptor who made it, Teresa Nipper, was a patient at the Purple House, and her contribution uh, was to make these um, sculptures that the Purple House would sell to raise funds for their work. Could you now, describe what the Purple House is? Just I would love to do that. <laughs> the, the Purple House and the Purple Buses are uh, places, um, health services. Uh, people go to the per- Purple House for dialysis, for kidney dialysis. And the Purple Buses are mobile kidney dialysis buses that visit remote communities. Kidney failure is a huge issue in Australian Indigenous communities. Uh, di- diabetes is a big issue, and then the you know consequential health um, uh, issues like uh, reduced kidney function become very serious very quickly because if you live in a remote community, it's harder to get the treatment that you need. So. The Purple House does a fantastic job in Alice Springs. People come from remote communities into Alice Springs and do their dialysis at the Purple House. But a lot of people really miss their um, their their home country. So the mobile buses go to remote communities for a few weeks at a time so that people can travel back to their community and have some time with their family uh in their home, surrounded by what's familiar to them. I I first got to know Purple House and the Purple Buses when I had the health portfolio, when I was a minister, right. the health minister, and we supported them financially then. But um, I guess uh, the Goanna, as well as, you know, supporting the work of Purple House, being, you know, doing it, by buying the Goanna myself, it reminds me every day of the enormous privilege of the work that I do. The the fact that um, oh, I've been in Parliament now for twenty years, and I've visited remote communities. I've been involved in the um, cultural and religious celebrations of all sorts of communities in my own electorate. Uh, you get a real insight into the diversity of Australian life because it's your job to represent everybody. And that that's just a that's just a privilege not afforded to many Australians that you you see every part of Australia, you meet with every community. And it, it has its um, difficulties. You know some of the issues we deal with are difficult, complex, hard to resolve issues. It's a lot of time away from home, the hours are long, it's a lot of work on weekends but overwhelmingly the opportunity of meeting with and representing so many different people on so many different issues is just just wonderful. It's just, it's just a, a great honour and my Goanna reminds me of that every day. And when are you going to take the top job? <laughs> uh, look, I, I've been very happy every day of my time in Parliament to be the member for Sydney, to be a minister or a shadow minister. It was a great honour to be the deputy leader of the Labor Party, a greater honour than I ever expected. So my focus is really on doing the job that I've got in the best possible way I can. Well, well you need to know that uh, my wife's mates, so you know, female book club, etc., they all want you to run for the top job. Well, so it's... get over yourself and <laughs> run for the top job. <laughs> well, that's very kind and very generous of them. But, you know, the most important thing is that we work as collaboratively as we can uh, as a party and as and I think as a parliament across the parties to, to uh, you know, to do the best for our nation. And personal ambition should be no part of that. I'm going to come on to my last traditional question. Could you please tell me who you would like to hear on Five of My Life next and why? I think Julia Gillard. I'd love to have Julia on, right. And I I think people would be really interested in hearing, I mean, the questions you ask are really so personal. 
I think people would love to see that side of Julia. She's got so many people who are so uh, affectionate towards her and think that she had a, a, a tough run as Prime Minister. A lot of personal attacks on her. I think there'd, there'd be a, a great number of people who'd be very keen to hear about her her favourite book, her favourite song, her favourite film, that that part of her. Wonderful. Well, then I might just ask you for her email when we finish. <laughs> Tanya we'll, we'll Joan do. Plebiscet, you have been an absolute roll gold legend. I'm going to ask you about those uh, bush walks later. Thank you so much for sharing a five of your life. It's been a pleasure. The Five of My Life was presented by me, Nigel Marsh. Producer, Alex Mitchell. Sound production and theme music by Darcy Thompson and Matt Nicholish. 